Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. Um, this is a special episode. We're not doing two episodes this week. You're just getting the episode early. Uh, <laughs> Easter eggs, Mr. Rainwater. Um, yes. They are a essential part of the Easter holiday, I guess, for those who celebrate in a more uh, secular way, I guess, right? Isn't that the, the word? Or is that part that of mean the actual... Secular meaning non-religious. Well, yeah, but it, it, I don't think the Easter Bunny is actually a religious figure, correct? That's a secular thing. That's like Santa Claus. <laughs> yes, and in the same way related to paganism and drugs. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but somehow, yes, the, the, that I get what you're saying now. Uh, it is related, but oh. it is a very... It's a very... Uh, windy path as to how how we got to easter eggs and easter and i don't i can't necessarily say that i'm fully knowledgeable in it i do know though like i said easter eggs easter bunny they're all pagan symbolism that got adopted by christianity long ago uh but that is for that is for another (laughs) podcast that is a podcast on symbolism right that's (laughs) when we we'll we'll put that one in the back pocket then um, uh, but yeah, Easter eggs are, yeah, I th- I get what you're saying now. They are an important part of like secular celebration of, uh, of Easter, right? Because it doesn't really have, as at least as far as the, far as the way that we treat it nowadays has pretty much nothing to do with the religious trappings. Yeah. I don't think of the holiday there was anything to do with, I mean, unless Jesus was <laughs> the, the prize and the giant rocks that he was buried behind, <laughs> Were the egg? I don't know if that's the symbolism the that hidden, they're going for. The hidden book of the Bible where <laughs> Jesus painted eggs and then hid them from the disciples. Yeah, no, I don't think that happened. It always reminds me of the Robin Williams joke where he's like, Rab- "Rabbits don't lay eggs. What is this?" <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, we're here today to talk about uh, Easter eggs in art, and I don't mean the actual eggs, but the more modern thing where there's hidden special features on dvds there's hidden little gems in the backgrounds of movies uh references to things that only certain people might understand or get um so i wanted to talk a little bit about uh certain types of easter eggs and possibly the benefits of using them in art or maybe even the what's the opposite of benefit uh the detractions the negative the negatives yeah, yeah that's a good way of of uh of putting these things in there so right off the bat the earliest easter egg i can remember ever seeing was on my x-men dvd there was a easter egg feature where you could go to an outtake where somebody jumped on during the middle of one of the x-men scenes and they had somebody run on set in a spider-man suit and it was a gag, and he was just like, oh, I'm on the wrong set, wrong movie, so sorry, blah, 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 and he went away. This was yeah. 2000, or like the 2000s. I can't really think of any Easter eggs before then. Is there anything coming to your mind that, that maybe was like a reference or something in a movie that... I know Pixar movies are pretty infamous for having Easter eggs in pretty much every movie. That's like I'm pretty true. sure they're uh they're like lamps, you know, like the they had that original yeah short with the lamps or also the their logo. That lamp is that lamp ends up in about I would say almost every Pixar movie right. because it is iconic mm-hmm. to them as a you know as, as a studio. Well, they uh, do, without... but also beyond. They do that a lot no, with uh, Disney. There's the hidden Mickey's, right? Oh, Isn't yeah. there the, the Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, that that shit's everywhere. I mean, we can go even further back where um the animators were putting like sex scenes in the backgrounds of uh, these classic <laughs> yeah. Disney cartoons. I think it's is it Rescuers Down Under where there's a scene where like they're flying on a bird and they go past like apartment windows and in one of the windows there's like a topless oh, woman. Oh, that that's right. That is, that's Rescuers Down Under. I remember that for sure. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's Somehow been that edited out. It. You can't run to your Disney yeah. Plus now and check that out because it's obviously been caught. Um, but back in the day, man, that was like something that was just there. It, it You know what I mean? Like it was one of those things All that you time. either found it or you didn't. And then once you found it, you could never not look for it again. Like it was distracting almost. 
And I think the reasoning for a lot of it, especially with animation, was because um, oftentimes, and speaking from personal experience in terms of comics, like animators kind of get bored thinking <laughs> up like all the things that they have to draw in a very busy background. Like, so for instance, uh, you know, imagine any given scene in the um, in the Star Wars prequel trilogy, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of scenes with a million characters, and I haven't. I'm saying this theoretically. I haven't actually like picked with a fine comb through the crowds in those movies, yeah. but I'm sure there is something in there where it's like, oh, what the hell? Like, there's what's a, that person? There's doing like there? a female Yoda or something at the end of the first uh, Phantom oh. Menace or something at the celebration scene or something. It's like okay. I, I think it's like right next to Yoda. It's like a pink, pink-ish Yoda, and it's got like one eye. It's like kind of piratey i don't know <laughs> i don't know but I, I i'm pretty sure that that was in there and then i know in like episode three i want to say in one of like the shots on like coruscant there's a the millennium falcon is like in amongst yes. like some of the traffic that's going yes. by or something i remember that one actually a lot but, uh yeah, I was just going to say, like, so I, I just say that as, like, example as mm. to, like, why Easter eggs usually even exist in the first place for certain situations, not every situation, but especially in animation, it's often because, like I said, animators get bored and they want to, like, put in stuff that they appreciate and like and see if other people, like, catch the hint, you know, uh, see... Um, See the see and enjoy and appreciate all the things that the artists appreciate, while not skirting too far into like licensing uh, issues, right? Sure. Yeah. Because <laughs> there is oftentimes where there are Easter eggs where it's like, oh, here's like uh, that looks very similar to the TARDIS from Doctor Who, or you know stuff like that. Often it happens. But um, for you, do you have any like Easter eggs that you can think of that are very memorable? in uh, any given movie that that pops to mind when you're thinking about this topic? Well, I mean, it's hard to think about what constitutes an Easter egg. Um, sure. Is it something that's discovered by people or that's purposefully inserted by the artist? Because the number right. one thing that I, start, I, I always think of is when the stormtrooper bumps his head in uh, A New Hope. <laughs> Not to get not to get <laughs> yeah. right back to our Star Wars thing, but once that's that was pointed one, out though. to me, I I can never watch that scene ever again without watching yeah. for it. And like, there's a sound effect and everything. I don't know if the sound effect was originally there or they added it in after the fact, but it's like prominent. And I always look at myself and go, "How the fuck did I miss that for so many years?" Um, that's the number one that sticks out for me. How about you? Yeah, like I said. Uh earlier like the pixar a lot of the stuff in pixar is what i remember the most um and they also and, they easter egg what the next movie is going to be right isn't that what yeah, they, they do a lot they have done that a couple of times they have done that a couple of times because i want to say i could be making this up but i do think as far as i remember and it might have been in toy story or a different movie mm -hmm. but like there's like um Something that looks like Mike, uh, what's his name, uh, from Monsters, Inc., mm -hmm. the one-eyed bald yep. creature, he shows up in one of those Pixar movies, I'm pretty sure, before Monsters, Inc. happened. Uh, and I cannot remember. I want to say it's Toy Story. That seems like the most obvious one that it would have been. But, uh, yeah, I, I those are the ones that I remember the most. I remember seeing a lot of... Um, I also remember seeing so video games also have like curious versions of Easter eggs too, where you oftentimes have situations where um, you get like like Mario Mario games would do that. Like there were some Easter eggs where, and these are kind of infamous, where it's like you can find Yoshi in Super Mario sixty four, but you have to like do all of these ridiculous tasks <laughs> in order to find him. Yeah, you know, it's a it's. I don't know if I'd call it, I guess it's still an Easter egg, but it's it's a reward that you get too, right? Mm. For doing these things. I wish I could I for the life of me, I cannot remember like all of the tasks. But you had to I think you had to get like all the stars and do all this other stuff and then find the secret room. Yeah. Uh that game had a lot of particular secrets like that though. And and a lot of times too with video games, it's often because 
uh, the developers will set up stuff just for themselves and then forget to take it down later before the game goes to public. <laughs> I had no idea. So it's a that's that's one of my and that goes back to what you're saying about like incidental situations, yeah. you know. Um, we can talk about well. So let's talk a little bit about like what are the what are the benefits like you were saying earlier about using Easter eggs in art. Uh, what for you? I mean, what kind of benefits do you feel like you get out of? I don't know if you've used it particularly in uh, scripts you've written, but e- even if you haven't, just like from movies that you've watched with Easter eggs, what kind of benefits do you feel like they provide for um, some the art? I, I this goes back to one of our earlier podcasts um, where I if it's if it's used correctly somehow if you can set up an Easter egg um, as a setup that pays off somewhere in a, like uh, the next oh, movie yeah, like um, a sequel or something like that sure. um, that to me shows like long term planning and that's that's almost like how you're talking about a reward for. Um, video games for like a film or something like that, that to me offers uh, like an eagle eyed viewer, like somebody who's watched a movie 27 times. Like when they go back, (laughs) they're the guy that gets it and they have to explain it to everybody else. And yeah, that's that little showboat thing that people get to do. And some people pride themselves on it a little too much, but to me, that's the fun shit. Like, um, I don't know if this can be considered an Easter egg, but like the end of the movie split, by uh, M. Night Shyamalan. Spoiler alert. Okay. When Bruce Willis shows up, um, I saw that movie in the theater with a friend, and tons of other like, and I want to I want to say kids because they were younger than me, but I don't want to imply that they were like fifteen. They were probably more like in their early twenties, and yeah. they had no fucking clue what was going on. To me, that was like, it's not an Easter egg or a twist, but it's somewhere in between the two. But sure. I was the one, I was the guy in the theater who was like, oh my God. As soon as Bruce Willis was like, Mr. Glass, no one else fucking got it. And I was just like, this is amazing. Like it turned out the entire movie of Unbreakable was an Easter egg for the end of this. <laughs> so like there's, there's that little bit of a reward system to it. To me though, yeah. most of the time... Easter eggs end up being distractions. Um, yeah. Or they set up um, false expectations, which is a bad thing. So you look at uh, the most recent, I don't know if you've watched it, the Marvel television show WandaVision. I haven't had a chance to yet. There were so many Easter eggs to so many obscure Marvel villains or technology or factions or whatever that. There were so many theories online that this was going to be the main bad guy. This was happening. Like people were endlessly debating and spinning these radical conspiracy theories about where the show was going to go, who was going to appear, what that meant. This was going to happen, yada, yada, yada. None of it fucking panned out. And (laughs) if you've noticed, there was a, a, I don't want to say an hostile reception to the ending of that show but people were genuinely genuinely upset with the end of it and a lot of it became because the things that they thought were going to happen didn't happen so it was it wasn't even subverting expectations it was a bait and switch like there was just false advertising with easter eggs does that make sense Yeah, yeah yeah and it distracted people from the thematic core of what the show was supposed to be about which was here's a superhero dealing with grief dealing with death and not being so perfect and lashing out and doing horrible things with their abilities and pushing off the responsibility that really is on their shoulders because they've been so devastated by a loss and that to me was fucking fantastic art like that is that's why I go to the movies and that is elevating the genre of comic book films and superhero movies to another level of legitimate art and storytelling and not just Big Bang shows up, giant blue laser in the sky, epic, you know, fight in the, you know, clouds and all this kind of shit. No, there was like core character development and there was something to say. 
And people overlooked that because these Easter eggs distracted them in so many different ways. And then on top of that, you look at things like um, back in Man of Steel when Zack Snyder made that movie. He had like Acme um, chemical or whatever in the background during the one of fight. And people were like, oh, that means the Joker's going to show up. And, blah, blah, blah. and to me, that's not necessary because when I'm watching that, aren't I supposed to be paying attention to the fight? of Superman and Zod isn't that what sure. the the sure. the narrative focus is supposed to be on um and it gets distracting because no matter what every time i watch that scene when it comes to that particular shot i'm not paying attention to the characters i'm trying to look for so, can i grab it can i see the sign I was, i'm curious to ask do you feel like that's more of a detraction like that detraction is is uh more of a negative versus the like specifically the acme um, example, like, is that more of a negative than the? Because I, I'm looking at, it, I'm thinking of the positive. Well, then that uh, that that creates the continuity of the DC universe, right? Because like, oh, okay, this you know ties things together, um, in terms of the world. Do you get what I'm asking? Yeah, but it's not essential to the story that was going on. Yeah, and Superman has yet to come face to face with the Joker in anything that we've sure. seen. So yeah, that, I mean, all. now granted there were uh Lex Luthor trucks that were blown up and stuff during the middle of it. And there was a Wayne tech satellite and stuff, but all of these Easter eggs happened during that giant fight scene. So it was almost like they were distracting you from this fight oh, scene that was going on the entire time. Yeah. Easter egg, Easter egg, Easter egg, Easter egg. And it's like, too much now granted that sounds like board animator territory yes <laughs> it does again. but uh, now on the flip side when i think when i when i look i think that you're right i think it's an aesthetic thing when it's like board animators it's a distraction yep. but when it's a writer doing it i feel like i can come to their defense because one of the greatest television shows of all time did easter eggs that no one understood until you had seen everything and then started rewatching it, which was Arrested Development. Because yeah, that's exactly the show I was thinking about. Because the somehow Rick. they implanted jokes in early episode that that would not make sense until you had seen the entire series, and that's brilliant. That's long term paying off. And the 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 thing about it was. It's not supposed to be distracting upon initial viewing. You're getting jokes already as it is. But now that you've already seen those jokes, now as you're watching again, you're getting a different joke that you never knew was there before. So it makes it almost endlessly entertaining. And it's also got that reward factor to it. So like to me, when you're writing an Easter egg into a piece of work, or at least a, um, a story, um, yeah. that there needs to be some kind of a setup payoff component to it. It can't just be a cool aesthetic that's thrown in there to distract you because to me, I, I need function behind it. I need, I need it to serve a purpose. Um, and I do think it might, I think to a certain extent it may also be, um, connected also to the genre. Cause like, it's mm. much easier to get away with doing Easter eggs and something like comedy where you're, it's predicated on you being distracted or being sort of thrown loop, thrown into loops a lot of the time. Yep. Whereas something very serious uh, or where you have to really connect dots, it can be, yeah, like you're saying, it can be very distracting to the point that you're not, you're actually like hurting your audience instead of helping, right. basically. But then you have things like Inception. Like there's that whole thing where people talk about, uh, and it's never really addressed in the film. It's just an observational thing where people notice that um, on Leonardo DiCaprio's finger, when he's dreaming, he's still wearing his wedding ring. And when he's not dreaming, his ring is off. Little little things like that, like a touch. I don't know if you would consider that to be an Easter egg, but that that's a, 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 a brilliant piece of aesthetic that I don't know if it was written in the script or not. I, I don't know if I – I think I might yeah. own the script. I might have to read the script. I, I bought the script and never read it. It's just a nice little – bookshelf piece <laughs> i was gonna ask you because you've you've watched batman Begins so many times did christopher nolan put anything like uh any sort of weird I mean, the, easter eggs in that movie 
not that I can tell. I mean, you could, I mean, you could say that yeah. the Joker card at the end. I mean, if one, you but... haven't seen any, <laughs> you haven't seen it because of anybody who would know. Yeah, I've seen that movie more times than anyone else that's alive. Probably even more than Christopher Nolan. Um, yeah. yeah, I, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything. Um, the only person who might be able to correct me on that is our friend Joker, uh, Matt Walters. Shout out. Uh, he hasn't seen it as many times as me, but if anybody has an eagle eye to pick up on that, he yeah, probably would. Yeah, attention to detail. Um, sure. Yeah. We, we might be able to pick his brain about that uh, next week when he and uh, the wonderful Diego will be making an appearance. Yeah. Here's your Easter egg for the episode. We just spoiled what <laughs> next week's episode's about. Um, so I'm curious to know, um, since we're talking about Easter eggs, in that same vein, there's another form of art that was kind of seen as novelty, I guess you could say, when we were kids. And I haven't seen a mm-hmm. lot of it these days. Um, and I feel like because it's just been over overlooked or shunned or whatever, but it was made to be a point in the Kevin Smith film Mallrats. And anyone who ever went through grade school knows what I'm talking about, even though you're not going to know this word, audio stereogram, which is basically dot art and you stare at it and you slowly oh, yeah, yeah. bring your eyes back and then like a three-dimensional image emerges it's like you you make yourself cross-eyed looking at it and it's like it's hidden art basically um i'm curious to know from your perspective because you deal closer to that kind of medium than i do um is that something that is like a lost art oddly enough hidden itself like is that something that could be used in uh like a graphic novel sense where people just read a a comic frame and think it's just a bunch of like dots or lines or whatever and if they were paying more attention could you put a story element into that and then someone may notice that if they do the audio stereogram pull away that they might see some hidden yeah thing or whatever have you noticed that that type of art well, Modern? you're you're <laughs> you've gotten my gears turning because I'm realizing that there is one particular comic book that's uh, one of my favorites and is as the story goes on becomes like just an Easter basket <laughs> as the <laughs> okay. story goes. And uh, this is League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. So wow. uh, League of the, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen ran for about um, I want to say. In max, probably eight to ten volumes. So it's a fair fair amount of story sure. to read. And uh, you know, from the beginning, it's pretty it's pretty basic. But as it goes on, and as you sort of as Alan Moore starts to write this world that he's creating out of, I mean, it's a world built out of out of fan fiction essentially, because it's he basically just takes like all of these, not just public domain, but also ideas from other stories around just England, like particularly English stories. And he basically makes a world out of it. So it's like, it's, I describe it as one of the best fan fictions of all time, because it's actually like extremely thoughtful and very interesting in the way that he puts everything together. So anyway, getting to my point, let's start with the audio stereogram thing. It's not quite what you're talking about, but it gets really close and there are aspects in um, aspects of this in um, two of his volumes. Uh, I say his, him and Todd Klein, both. But um, who's the artist? So in the, I can't remember the name of it, the Black Dossier, there is, we're introduced to this place called the Blazing World. And in order to read the pages that the blazing, where the Blazing World takes place, you have to wear 3D glasses. Hmm. So... okay. Uh, it's a really interesting convention to actually like bring across the idea that, okay, this realm is separate from, it's like a different dimension from the rest of the world that, uh, all the characters in the league exist in. Cause it's supposed to be like this fairy world. It's supposed to be sort of this place where, uh, all of their fantasies sort of exist and live. So that's the beginning of it. Uh, as you go into the last volume, this is in the Tempest. It's called the Tempest. Uh, it's suddenly like 
they go to the they go to the deep end with it where it's like I think for one they figured out how like Todd Klein figured out how to um is it Todd I'm I need to make sure it's actually <laughs> Todd Klein. I keep wanting to say Kevin Klein but I cuz I think that's because I'm thinking of the actor. Um <laughs> but anyway, uh the artist whose last name is Klein um figures out that no it's not Klein at all it's Kevin O'Neill. I my apologies Kevin O'Neill. Uh Kevin O'Neill who is the artist on um League of Extraordinary Gentlemen figured out how to uh do it better. So like in the Tempest there starts to be some stuff that emerges out of just like the the 3D mishmash yeah. and so you get you get more than just looking at it as the flat 2D spread cuz you can read it without the glasses but I think it's better with the glasses. So anyway, uh by well, the how, last how, couple How old is on? League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, right? That's an older Come. Yeah, Tempest, Tempest was the last volume, and it was released uh, in 2019. I want to say. Oh, okay. So it, yeah, it, but it, the way that they ran it, like it started way back in maybe 99, 98. Wow. And so they would release a volume every couple of years. Oh, okay. So yeah, it was kind of it was one of those kinds of projects where, um, you know, like you would. If you wanted to read it the soonest, you just pick up like the floppies in the comic book shop back when we had comic book shops. I guess they're coming back, hopefully. Anyway, um, but uh, point being, it took them a long time to finish it. And I think, you know, for how many volumes it is, 20, 20 years is a good pace, I'd say, for what it is. Yeah. Um, so anyway, my point being is towards the end of uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, though, uh, Alan Moore starts pulling out more and and Kevin O'Neill both start pulling out more and more literary references just in the background that have nothing to do at all with uh, the plot or anything. But what it does do is it, it as you go on, it kind of further cements this idea of like, OK, this is this this is this world of if you had a world composed entirely of all the fictional works of the world, mm. basically. And it becomes kind of a compelling idea to think about, just to kind of imagine. Yeah. And uh, and it lends a certain. It doesn't. It doesn't function super well, or it doesn't function super powerfully from a plot standpoint or a narrative standpoint, other than it creates an atmosphere. And that is, that is for me what I, why I use that as an example as like a really excellent use of Easter eggs is because. After a while, like as I was reading the book, I would I just kind of go back and flip through and be like, oh shit! Like there's like you know, this character who's just some side character from some some uh, science fiction novel that nobody's read. You know, like yeah. he makes he makes reference he makes like very nuanced and subtle references to like uh, books that I'm probably one of the few people who have ever even read the books. So like for me, it's like oh that's really you know I'm chuffed to have that. But I'm sure that only works for, you know, very specific readerships. Like, the average Joe who reads League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is just going to scratch their head and be like, I don't know what the fuck I'm looking at, yeah. you know? Whereas somebody who is like an avid Alan Moore reader would get the most out of it. Like, for me, it's it's heaven, right? Yeah. For everybody else, it probably sucks. <laughs> And that's fair. Well, but here's <laughs> you bring up an interesting point because like one of my favorite films, which we talked about and we will probably talk again and again and again, um, is the movie Scream. And it was one of the first yeah. meta films which referenced the fact that it was a it, it was it was a horror film in a sense. They were treating real life as if it were a horror film, but within it they were referencing other horror films, which you could consider to be Easter eggs because those horror films that they were referencing obviously were taking inspiration or the, the the film itself was taking inspiration from the films that it was referencing. So for me, I had never seen some of these horror films. And as a horror guy, I was like, well, shit, now I got to go check this out. Because if this movie that I love is referencing this movie that I've never seen, obviously I want to taste that. I want to go and yeah. like it's good enough to be referenced or Easter egged or whatever that I should probably go check it. Like, I don't think I, I don't know if I ever would have watched uh, when a stranger calls or the town that's dreaded sundown or, 
some of these other films that are referenced in Scream yeah, if it hadn't I, been referenced. I know exactly what you're talking about for sure. Uh, that's and that that's uh, for me like uh, there's a lot of my, some of my favorite literature has our movies or whatever has stuff where I'm like, what the hell is that? Like mm. I, I want to learn more about this. Like uh, the, the anime Neon Genesis Evangelion has a lot of these aren't nece- I wouldn't necessarily call these Easter eggs. They're more like just obscure references yeah and uh there's a lot of obscure references to like kabbalah and other um occult traditions in as a like in high school i was like what is all this stuff like is the artist just making this up or like does it have because it seemed grounded in something and i didn't know what and so for me being a curious teenager like i just went on the internet and started looking up stuff and over time like i started learning from all this, I start learning like a whole treasure trove of like different spiritual practices, religious ideas. Just like it was a bombshell that went off for yeah. me personally yep. in my personal life. And it just came from like uh, a robot anime. Like <laughs> it was one of the weirdest things. But uh, to me, like I would say that is something that I admire about art that that does that where it's especially if it's stuff where you don't need to know it to enjoy it but it's there it's it's and I, that's where i go uh, on. what do they used to call it it was like um uh, not supportive reading but it was like the summer reading list or whatever or like if you read this book and you read these other books that it would support the things that the themes yeah. and help you understand stuff better it wasn't like cliff notes or anything like that but it was like um, uh, I don't know what the word is to describe it, but it was like um additional reading that stuff. You know what I mean? Like, and it was like yeah. the artist was saying, "Hey, this is cool shit that I enjoy, and if you enjoy this, what I'm doing, you might enjoy this too." So it was kind of like, "Oh, well, I've ran out of every episode of this TV show to watch, but they reference this this book or something, this philosopher or whatever. I'm gonna check that out to fill the time. Like that that expands your horizon. So I I mean." And the best thing I think what you pointed out is sometimes they do it where it is I don't know if I'd call it an Easter egg, but it is kind of embedded. It's not like drawing attention yeah. where somebody starts naming off books that you should be reading because no one wants to watch or listen to a sermon about, you know, what you should be doing. But yeah. if it piques your interest and you're like, Oh, that's really interesting and then you go by a message board and someone's like, Oh yeah, that was a reference to this. To me that is an Easter egg. Like that's a, a, a little hidden uh, that's hidden writer art that's like underneath the subcurrent of what's going on in the yeah. the story you're watching. And it's like, yeah, I can, I can deal with some more of that. Sometimes I definitely would say it's, it's like an Easter egg and that it creates a hunt. It creates a trail yes. that you start to get on. Yeah. It's just like, wait a minute, there's something here. Like there's something here that isn't talked about at all in the story that has something to do with either the director or the writer or yeah. whoever. And I want to find out more because there's something interesting there. And, and that that's is fun. Yeah. That's yeah, adding exactly. a layer of fun into your art and storytelling, um, which actually leads me into the, the next kind of hidden art that I wanted to bring up, which is hidden art itself. Um, more notably, so a reference that to make it a little clearer about what I'm talking about, um, the debate about whether or not the Mona Lisa is actually Leonardo da Vinci painting himself or painting himself as a woman. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's the, the the kind of thing that kind of inspired, like, the Da Vinci Code, where it's like, oh, yeah. you know, are these numbers on this thing is really here and this kind of that. What's your take on that kind of stuff? Like, do you think <laughs> – well, does, I mean... <laughs> add, does that add, like, a notoriety to an otherwise generic painting of a woman standing in front of a mountainscape? Like, the, it adds a little bit of mystery and mystique to, to what's going on. Is that something that – that's Easter egg-ish, right? It's very Easter eggish, but it's also very Renaissance because the the whole Renaissance uh, or what we call the Renaissance is a time of uh, a lot of intrigue historically. And so Leonardo da Vinci was kind of, in a lot of ways, probably the tip of the spear in terms of just weird intrigue in all of these artists' work. And a lot of that has to do, I think, with the fact that the Renaissance period was a period when artists were were 
they were coming to a forefront in terms of like being intellectuals, mm. uh, exploring, experimenting. Uh, you know, the, like people like to talk to, about Da Vinci as like the quintessential Renaissance man because he was somebody who was not only like uh, learning learning ways of painting that hadn't been used in centuries, um, but also was like experimenting, doing scientific work that was sometimes extremely grotesque, like exhuming corpses so that he could like do sketches of them. Sometimes of pregnant women, sometimes of whoever, you wow. know, just like, yeah, he was kind of a freak. Right? I had no like, idea. Actually, our, That's, This is news to me. Our, from our perspective, Leonardo da Vinci is somebody who <laughs> not only would have probably been canceled, but <laughs> to jail because <laughs> he was doing things that were outside <laughs> of the norm. And uh, he was a really curious cat. Like he, he apparently only slept like something like 40 minutes a day and had this like crazy like i watched the video it's on you can find it on youtube where this person um this is not like attempts. conspiracy level stuff this is like fact this is like 100 yeah, yeah. percent hardcore fact, fact. Yeah, this is historical fact that like leonardo da vinci was a weirdo like he wrote backwards uh nobody really knows why he wrote backwards That's but apparently sick. it was for you know uh, keeping his own, you know, keeping secret, keeping his secrets on like what he was discovering or whatever, you know, because I think he considered himself as a man of science just as much as an artist, right? Mm. So anyway, this is all. I say this as somebody who's also read the Da Vinci Code <laughs> and like, okay, <laughs> there's a whole. Um, it's part of the difficulty of that is trying to figure out how much is fact and how much is just like Dan Brown making shit up. Um. But a fair amount of it is like grounded in in historical in historical fact, and um, and the Renaissance period was a period of people inventing ciphers because they were trying to keep secrets between different different um, factions that were in competition. A lot of times, bankers. This was a period of time where finance was becoming a major point in world history sort of in the same way that people sort of make a big doubt of cryptocurrency yeah back in the renaissance period, like the cryptocurrency of that time was just the fucking banking system yeah. and that's why you have uh, the medici family who is supposed to be this really infamous um basically like a mob or a syndicate of the time uh anyway forever about renaissance italy it's really fascinating to me because there's so much there's so much there a lot of the paintings in Renaissance uh, Italy, Italy have uh, uh, what I would call uh, hidden messages, uh, hidden symbolism, um, uh, stuff that refer uh, to often to pagan uh, ideas. ideas. Because this was a time that was uh, largely, I don't know, how would I put it, like largely dominated by the Catholic Church. And so there were a lot of people. Leonardo da Vinci would probably be included in this lot, along with a lot of other artists who were trying to go outside the norm and were thinking outside the norm and doing religious practices that were not considered like normal for the time. Yeah. And so a lot of the art at that time has, and you have to look for it, and this is why they were probably Easter eggs, right? Little things that once you start connecting the dots, sort of connect to the religious ideas that these people had. Um, the philosophical ideas that they had, and also UFOs. Yes! I was going to bring that up. There are UFOs in the backgrounds of some pa classic paintings, and I was like, what the fuck? That's an Easter egg. <laughs> <laughs> UFOs uh, are actually probably, historically, probably the most predominant Easter egg throughout just history. Like, you just, like... You can find them in so many different things, and you know we we all have several different questions as, as to why that is, right? But uh, I would I would say probably maybe the most powerful Easter egg of 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 human history is the UFO. Absolutely, it's just one of those things that it, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yes, and that's 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 I think one of the 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 last things that I want to end this particular episode about is. Uh, like the weight that an Easter egg carries. Um, 
when you put it into your art. Like it's one of those things that, I, like I said, it becomes distracting. So it needs to be meaningful to me, yeah. at least. I don't know about you, but like I feel like once I've I've got my Sherlock Holmes hat on as to why that's there, it ain't coming off. And I'm going to be studying it be until I get a concrete, solid answer from uh, the artist as to why that's there. Like, if it's a goof, like Star Wars, like with the Stormtrooper head thing, like, that's, there's my answer. Boom. Yeah. But if I get, you know, another thing where it's like, why is the, the Millennium Falcon in the traffic scene or whatever? You made a very valid point. It was probably a, a very bored animator that was like, I'm going to sneak this by George. Exactly. Um, but nowadays, that just means, oh, there's going to be a Disney spinoff about the Millennium Falcon at Coruscant, and we're going to have 12-episode miniseries, and, blah, blah, blah. and now it's like, oh, now it just can't be fun. Like, I, I, yeah. I realized I said, <laughs> like, 20 minutes ago that it needs to be functional, it needs to serve yeah. a purpose and set up and pay off. But that setup and payoff doesn't need to be, you know, a, a three film trilogy with a comic book uh, follow up and a prequel to it. And it, it's a fucking Easter egg. Like, that's that's the thing. Easter eggs are not Christmas presents. This is not the <laughs> this is not the big show. Yeah. This is little candies to kind of to munch on or a dollar here or there to just kind of, you know, do what you will with. But they're not supposed to be giant game-changing things i mean they could be it's storytelling i you know you can't put a roof on the possibilities but for me an easter egg is just supposed to be a little fun thing that somebody put in there that maybe distracts you or adds to the experience after the fact um i don't know if it should be distraction because i always feel like that just means that your art yeah. is sucking yeah right <laughs> But that's just me. But I mean, if you make it a part of the art, like how we were talking about um, with the audio stereogram, with the eyes pulling back, you're inviting people. Like you said, it creates an atmosphere. It builds a world. It's yeah. putting you into the art a little bit more. It's that world building that um, that I think we all kind of expect these days. Yes, that's the, that's Absolutely. the big thing. Is like there there is substantial ways to distinguish between an amateur artist and a professional artist. And there's expectations of what, what you're going to get from each. And I feel like an amateur artist that is smart enough to put in an Easter egg, not to some other thing like Alan Moore, like a referential Easter egg, but like an Easter egg to their, their own art. That to me is elevating your artist status a little bit more in the eyes of your audience where it's like, oh, this person is investing long term into the story that they're telling me, which yeah. means maybe I should give it some more attention. I, I'm not going to get distracted on my phone or do this or that. And it adds a little bit to it. What would you say um, would be the the takeaway for Easter eggs from your perspective? Yeah, like what you're saying, um, I really enjoy I really enjoy having little details in a story that add to it, but you don't have to notice it, but it's there, you know, because to yeah. me, it shows an appreciation or it shows effort by the artist. Like in, in just to sort of mirror what you're saying, it shows effort by the artist to further establish the world that they're creating. But I also do really like Easter eggs that turn into <laughs> like a Dan Brown novel where I'm just like, wait a minute, what does this mean? What is the code? You know? Yeah. Or, uh, you know, things like UFOs where it's like suddenly it opens up this whole other this whole other aspect of the art that doesn't even have to necessarily do with the art, but has to do with the world around you. And really, really, um, you know, that's a way in which unintentionally, probably a way in which art can really impact the world around you where you suddenly are looking at everything around you totally differently. Because now you're you're looking for hidden messages and things. Granted, that can get paranoid, but still, uh, a little paranoia is fun every once in a while. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, anyway, my point being, um, I do enjoy Easter eggs that exist to create a hunt or a pursuit for something outside of the art, because it ultimately ties back in in some way, even if it's just to appreciate the artist in a new light basically 
I agree. So there we have yeah. it. There we have it. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be our probably our shortest podcast. Um, we're about 46 minutes in, which is a half hour shorter than usual. But you know what? It's Easter if you're listening to this the day that it drops. So you should probably be eating some food, uh, stuffing your face with chocolate bunnies or marshmallow chickens. Um, but if not, we invite you to re- take the remaining half hour that you would normally be listening to this episode and start working on some art. Uh, yeah. Three months ago, four months ago now. Four, wow, four months into this year. Jesus. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> uh, we gave you a podcast about just getting started. And you know damn well your ass has not gotten started yet because <laughs> artists are inevitably procrastinators at heart. So take the next half hour and start working on developing your art. Whatever it is that idea was that you were going to do this year, do it. Start planning it out. Make a outline. Draw a concept. Buy the markers. I don't care what it is that you're doing. Start making progress on it right now. Just do whatever you're doing. If you're driving and listening to the podcast, talk out loud to yourself and start giving a name to the character that's going to be leading us through your story. I don't care. Use this time wisely. I'm legitimately yeah. going to put black space between now and the 115 mark so that you think this episode goes for an entire episode length. <laughs> but it's not. It's just going to end right here. Unless Mr. Rainwater's got anything to say, I'm done. All I would say is, in, uh, just mirroring what Jao was saying, now's the time to uh, create your cipher or codex that you're going to implant into your art. Uh, I I highly recommend for musical artists out there, uh, Morse code. That that can work great for a piece of art if you know how to like uh, create a cipher out of beat. Um, <laughs> Those are some ideas, some thoughts. Wow, we didn't even talk about music that can be played backwards and have a that different... Is, uh, that is a whole other Easter egg, yes. Yeah, maybe that's another episode. You know, we'll have to have like Joe Bevs on and, yes. and talk talk shop with him about how that's even possible, how you do that, because that kind of stuff blows my mind. This is a topic I think we can explore a little bit more because, again... I'm fascinated with the audio stereogram pulling away thing. Yeah. How you even make that kind of art blows my mind. So I, I think we'll revisit this in the future. But for now, guys, we are signing out. Have a happy Easter. Or if you don't celebrate, have a happy Sunday. I don't care. Go do your goddamn art. Peace. <laughs>